Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show and welcome to Auspicious Tuesday. <laughs> it's not Walk on Wednesday, it's Auspicious Tuesday. And why is it auspicious? Because there's a full moon and on this particular full moon, it's a special holiday in India. It's called Bhadra Purnim, the very auspicious moon day. And this is the day of distributing transcendental wisdom. And so, Kostubi, you want to talk about our, our Walk on Tuesday, Walk on Auspicious Tuesday guests? Yeah, sure. Well, our, our special, we've had them on before. It's, it's brahmacharis from the Yugodama Ashram. We have hey. Mahotsaha. Mahotsaha. We got Gopal Champu. These are two very dear to my heart, these two. Uh, and, you know, they were known for every single day for years. They go out on the streets, you know, of New York City, particularly in Union Square, and and uh, share teachings of Bhagavatam, you know, Bhagavad Gita, et cetera, with the people. And now they've relocated due to COVID. They're down south now. But uh, th- this is like this day, the Bhajra Purnima. It says in the Bhagavatam itself, in the 12th canto, that if you give the gift of the Bhagavatam on this day, that uh, you, 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 go, you reach that, the highest spiritual destination, you know. And so they make it a special effort to like help facilitate that. And so actually it's kind of a can, maybe you, I'll let you tell us, but you know, we're, we're really grateful to have you here on the show this morning. Today's the big day. So if someone wants to uh, sponsor, give a gift of, of the Bhagavatam, even to themselves, <laughs> uh, they can do that today. So maybe you self-care. can share. Self-care. A little self-care. That's real self-care self-care right there. You get yourself a box. Yeah. And, um, and maybe you can just share a bit with, with us about the campaign itself and, and how people can go about participating. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Wonderful. Hare Krishna. Everyone. Good morning. Um, first of all, very grateful to Raghunath and Kastu who so allow us to come in here and share with all of you. It's our pleasure. So, if you could just be a little bit louder, please. Yes. So the, uh, the Bhadra Purnima, it's uh, like Kastuba Prabhu was mentioning, it's a very special, special day. Um, and this full moon day, like he was describing in the Bhagavatam itself, in the 12th canto, it describes that one who gives the gift of the Srimad Bhagavatam um, on this day attains a supreme destination. So this is Krishna himself, or it's, it's being, it's described right in the Srimad Bhagavatam that one can have this very special opportunity and it is really the greatest gift. You know, what other greater gift than that than to go back to the spiritual world where um, every word is a song, every step is a dance. And this is our, this is our goal. Um, so on this day, um, what we're doing is we're just, the, the Budro campaign overall was a, um, was a push that was made after discovering this, this, this benediction in the Bhagavatam a couple of years ago by His Grace, uh, by Shei Shekha Prabhu. And so we've been doing this worldwide campaign where we're trying to um, make the mo- most people fortunate possible. And so I, as, lo- as far as here in the U.S., um, we're, very, we're trying to facilitate this um, with any devotees that want to give a set to somebody or want to give one to themselves just by sending in your information. 
Um, we have a web, uh, an email, NYC Bhakti. And, NYC uh, Bhakti, that's NYC B-H-A-K-T-I at gmail.com. At gmail.com. And just by sending us your information and then providing uh, some, just the details, we can send this set anywhere in the U.S. and also internationally. Um, okay. And uh, as far as the price of the sets, at least in the U.S., we, um, we're doing it for two ninety nine, and that includes the shipping. Okay. Um, and then we do have a, a separate, um, there is, for the Budget Pranima, a very special fire sacrifice that's happening. And also another um, benediction, that we're, another uh, part of the, of the program, which we're doing in India, which I'll let Mahot Sipurbu describe to you. He's from so, South India. He can yeah, yeah. So I got a home team advantage in this. Right. <laughs> so... Um, uh, we we actually have uh, one of our uh, devotees over there. That his name is Veda Narayana Prabhu. His literally his name means like one who likes to distribute the Vedas. Okay. So he is going to villages in Tamil Nadu, and he is um, giving these books to families who are interested in Krishna consciousness, but they cannot afford to buy these books because you know, like even after ten years of working so hard, it'll be mm. hard for them to afford the set. Mm. So you know they're giving it for the for the for the, for the families. They're giving it to the children. I mean, because even these children, you know, like we can, they're not so much conditioned by everything else. So they naturally have an inclination to know about Krishna. So you know, we are uh, we are we are trying to somehow the other uh, requesting everyone with the straw between our te teeth to please help facilitate this uh, amazing thing for all these children, so they can also have the great fortune of growing up with the Sriman Bhagavatam. They will really treasure. Treasured in the home, right? It's like that's yeah. like, like we treasure a television set. Everyone gathers around their yeah. home, like <laughs> bar with Tom for them. It's like the real thing, and and it'll be given in their own local language. Yeah, as well. we're, we're we're giving it to them in Tamil, like they actually ordered uh, Tamil Srimad Bhagavatam says It looks very similar to like the English one, right? So they um, can, so you can sponsor for the, for people in Tamil Nadu for the mm -hmm. villagers. And how much does that cost? Is it the same thing? So we, we're requesting, yeah, we're requesting, uh, you know, devotees to please help with like, if, you know, if they can give 300, it helps two families. Also, because mm -hmm. we are, uh, he's also preaching in schools. So like these kids, they also are learning English also. You know, so, you know, we're, we're trying to even give them an English bar with them. I, I, didn't, under, I didn't understand. You, you get two for 300 with Tamil yeah, ones? Okay, but if, okay, can they do one or they get to have to do two? No, 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 one is fine also. So that would be half of 300? I just yeah. want to get it clear. Yes. Yeah, so sure. 150 for one or two for 300. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the one in America is 300 with yes, the ship. Exactly. And, and then the, the Brahmin priest in Ahobalam, the very holy place, which is associated with the pastimes of the Avatar and Shringhadev, they'll, they'll be doing a real auspicious kind of ceremony and your name will be included for everyone that that uh, contributes that that will be on a list as part of that that your name will be chanted along with the mantras and then they'll throw stuff in the fire and it, it'll bring <laughs> it'll be good stuff right? good. yeah we're yes. looking okay. forward the, sacrifice, the, the fire sacrifice will happen uh, uh september 2nd india time at 7 30 in the morning which would be 10 p.m eastern standard time um and the cutoff for the names uh, will be 1 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, September 1st. So do it quick. Yeah, so you can do that today. And then also okay. we're, we're going to be requesting um, special blessings for the Wisdom of the Sages community, which they're, oh. they're, they're giving their time every day to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. This is very... Uh, Nityam Bhagavata Seva, yeah, as it said in the Bhagavatam, every day hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. So mm. All of you are doing the greatest activity. Thank you so much. So that means everybody. That means our we'll get blessed. Our Zoomers, our others, all the thousands of people that listen, they will be mentioned as like the wisdom of the sages family in that ceremony. Yeah. You will definitely bless the others also or just the Zoomers. We'd like to get you to the bottom <laughs> of others, <laughs> others blessed. We're always got to <laughs> open up his heart more to the others. You know? <laughs> Everyone who heard it before, who's hearing it now and will hear it in the future, will all be included. So okay. September 2nd, they do that special yagya. Uh, so yeah, Mara, you, you can notice that you can feel something on September 2nd. Just hold on and you're just going to feel something come over your body. Mara, maybe she'll start dancing ecstatically. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so anyway, you know, Wisdom of Sages people are catching on. Like yesterday, even during the show in our chat board, you know, everyone pulled together to get Sega set. Sega, yeah, be coming your yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and, and a lot of other people have kind of written into us saying, hey, we're ready to give a set to someone. Just, you know, you, you choose the person. So we're so appreciative of that. If you want to do that, get to us early so that we can get this all done tomorrow. And if you don't get it done tomorrow, it's always auspicious to do anyway. Yeah, right? exactly. We don't have to do it. Okay. So guys, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, but one last thing. One last thing, yeah. We are making sure that the, that the devotee who's doing the teaching in the villages in Tamil Nadu takes pictures of the families and the oh, children yeah. who are receiving the Bhagavatam sense. Yeah. So we'll also be sending that, you know, over. You know, so for, you know, whoever donates, like, you know, we'll tell them that, you know, because if you are donation, such and such a family. You got, see a photo of the family and hear a little bit about who they are and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we are, uh, you know, we're doing that also. Beautiful. The okay. gift of knowledge. And then you can go yes. visit them someday, right? Yeah, you yeah. actually could. Actually. And read Bhagavatam together. In English. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. You probably get the best meal of your life, too. That's good. That's right? In the That's Tamil good. village. Forget yeah. it. All right. Might be a little spicy for some minute. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much. It's so great to have you here always. And, and, and really, thank you for all the service that you do. It's so Perfect. important that these are people that just dedicate their life to serving others. It's beautiful. Thank you. Haribo. Haribo. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, the gift of wisdom. What's, how is there a better gift than the gift of wisdom? Even if, you've got, even if you've got everything, if you don't have direction in your life, what good is all your stuff? All your collectibles. What good is that if you don't know where to go in this world? You know, this is, I'd say, the most important gift you could ever give someone, which is the gift of spiritual direction through Vedic teachings. It's yeah. actually... Then I started thinking, knowledge. Yeah, then I started thinking, well, if we're doing the Bhagavatam on a regular basis, I wonder if we get extra credit from them. <laughs> I wonder if they're going <laughs> to... They're not giving the Bhagavatam per se, but actually me and Kostuba are giving some gifts too. We're happy to do, be part of yeah, this. Yeah, we're and both, both Rog and I, we're going in on some Bhagavatam sets for people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let's go in. You know, I was just reading, rereading the first canto. I'm just going to read the first one, one, two, if you don't mind, because it's sort of an invocation. Then we'll read our regular invocations. But it's such a pretty... Pretty verse. Dharma projita kaita bhutra parama namatsaranam satam vidyam vastavam apravastu shivadam tapatrayan mulanam shimad bhagavate mahamuni kritike kimbai parar ishvaraha saryo hridyana barudya tetra kriti bi shushrubi tat shanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavad Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure at heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of the Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within the heart. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. Kicking back, reading that with someone the other day, and I just said, you know what? We should read this sort of as an invocation. Um, but, but what do you say we dive in okay. to our... regular invocation verses and then dive into the Bhagavatam. We're in Canto 2, Chapter 2. Narayanam naraskritya naram chayva narutamam devim sarasvatim vyasam tatojayam udirayat. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the personality of Godhead Narayan. Unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta Prayeshva Badreshu Nicham Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki. By regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, 
All that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed. And loving service to the personality of Godhead, who has praised the transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. Alrighty. Okay, we are in t- uh, two, 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 thirty-one. Thirty-one. Yeah, we we just so so maybe uh, give us a little catch up. Uh, give us a little catch up. Yeah. So you know, of course, we read the whole first canto, and that first canto culminated where where Maharaj Pariksit finally met Shukadev Goswami. He's got seven days left to live. He's sitting on the bank of the river. All the sages are there. Shukadev Goswami, the 16-year-old, wanders in, but he's everyone recognizes he's special, right? He's totally transcendentally situated, yogi. Yeah. And and so then they, uh, they he asks the first question. You know, he says, "What is what is a person meant to do when they're about to die, and what should they not do?" You know. And so in, in response to that, in this chapter, we hear about different practices of yoga that one can focus on. And we hear about two practices, but right now, and you know, Bhagavatam can be a little confusing sometimes, like and it's all building up to the verses that we're starting to read today. Like he's, first he described, you know, if you have trouble, a lot of people have trouble conceiving of God in a personal form, that's okay. If that's, if that's an issue, it's not a problem. You can meditate on God in, in terms of the universe and, and see the mountains, you know, as part of the body of the Lord and the oceans and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and that's, you know, uh, understood as being like a, a first very positive step. Um, and then he described, and we were reading these verses yesterday, very far out verses, right? About how a yogi, like a very accomplished yogi can through through a yogic practice, you know, raise the life airs through the different chakras and exit their own body, right? Just leave it behind. You gotta seal off all the gates of you your body. Seal. I know that you find it. Can't get that out of my mind. <laughs> okay. okay. Cover your eyes and your ears and your nostrils and your anus and Yeah, and then and, then, and so and this is, you know, a very you have to be a super yoga master to be able to accomplish this and and then, and then it described how, you know, the body is made up of these different elements. You know, the, the, the five, what's called the Mahabhutas, earth, water, fire, air, ether. And then there's the more subtle elements of mind, intelligence, and ego. And it describes this, as, and it's described that the universe is like a gobstopper, right? Yeah. And it's got different layers of each of these elements. And as the yogi was passing through each one of those elements, he was letting go of the earth. He was letting go of the water. He was letting go of the fire until he just let go of even the ego at the very end. And penetrated the coverings of the universe, right? Mm-hmm. And went went on into the spiritual realm. And then we read a commentary yesterday where Shiva Prabhupada was saying that this is an authentic practice, but it's really not viable for people in this age, right? Yeah. Have you met any yogis that can do that, Raghunath? Um, I know a couple. Okay. A couple of, a couple of my local cl- up here in upstate New York. They're doing it on a regular basis. Okay. But it's rare, at least. Right? It's very rare. Very okay. rare. And, and so in that commentary, what Shil Prabhupada did is he referred to some of the writings from this text, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, which describe the Bhakti Lata Bij, how the seed of Bhakti is sown in the heart of the yogi, of the Bhakti yogi, and how if we water that seed with hearing and chanting, with hearing Bhagavatam and chanting, the, you know, Maha Mantra and so on, that that seed begins to sprout and grow. But as it grows, you have to be careful to protect it. So you build a fence around it so that, you know, we have to protect it from um, different things like being, like not being respectful to people that deserve respect. We're being respectful to every living being, but what to speak of like deeply spiritual people. We have to be very careful about this. And it also described that there are weeds that grow, like the desire for prestige or also being callous towards the sufferings of others and things like this. So we're watering the reed with this is it's describing the process of bhakti yoga that the guru you know the spiritual teachers they plant that seed of bhakti in the heart we water it with hearing and chanting we protect it by being very careful about our own behavior we pull out the weeds of of unwanted motivations and, and you know and, and not being 
careful and gentle in how we deal with others, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then we can carefully garden, you know, like, you know, protect that, that growing creeper. And then that creeper, it said, grows and it penetrates all the different coverings of the universe and enters the spiritual realm. And that's a viable path that we can all practice. And we see people practice that, right? We, 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 we see people that achieve that, that goal. So now, so whereas this chapter, Sukadeva Goswami has told um, Maharaj Parikit about these other practices, now he's going to get to what he's really recommending. And so it's at the end of the chapter where he says, this is really what you should focus on. And then it's going to continue in, in future chapters. So that's where we pick up today on text number 31. All right. Only the purified soul can attain the perfection of associating with the personality of Godhead in complete bliss and satisfaction on, in his constitutional state. Whoever is able to renovate such devotional perfection is never again attracted by this material world, and he never returns. Well, that's a pretty good one. Yeah. Whoever is able to renovate such devotional perfection is never again attracted by this material world and he never returns. You know, we, we, we go through this, you know, here's a good like little Sanskrit phrase that people, we were thinking about the words of the day, Sanskrit phrases of the day, this boga tiaga. Boga tiaga. Boga, right? Yeah. It's a good one to like to enjoy and then to renounce and then to enjoy. We, we, get, we, we take in materialism. We're like, oh, this is great. This is great. And we're like, we're disgusted by it after a while. And then we say, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm not, I'm going to stop dating or I'm going to stop, I'm overeating. I'm going to fast. And we go from this indulgence to renunciation, like a pendulum back and forth. And so the Bogatiaga of the material world is like this game we play maybe for lifetimes. But when you finally get to this point, renovating such devotional perfection is never again attracted when you actually find like, you know what? No, there's nothing here in this material world that will fulfill that hole in my heart. It takes that type of dedication. So you don't re-enter into that indulgence in the material world again. Um, I think this is the, we should talk to the 12 step people, our Bhakti recovery group. This is the ultimate addiction. There's an addiction in the heart that I feel, I feel if I just put something in there, anything except God, I will be fulfilled. And it's, we all have this material addiction, mm -hmm. an, attra an attraction, an addiction that we are not recovered from. I want to renovate this. I guess, it's, I guess it's like an excavation of devotional perfection because I guess we're all, we're all devotees underneath all, the, all that, that addictive mind. Kasub, huh? G? Well, you know, it's interesting you say it like that uh, because it just relates so much that we're just saying that we are devotees underneath it all, you know? And, and, and when we were reading that commentary yesterday about how Prabhupada was saying, you know, that the seed of bhakti is there um, and then it's watered mm. by hearing and chanting, by hearing Bhagavatam, by chanting these mantras and so on. It, it reminded me of very important teachings uh, that are in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, right? Shared by Sri Chaitanya. And there's a famous verse, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema. You know this one? Nitya yep. Siddha Krishna Prema. Uh, Sadhya Kabunaya. Shravanadi Shurachiti Karya Udaya. So Shravanadi means, Shrava, Shravana means beginning with, Adi means beginning with. So Shravanadi means beginning with hearing. And that includes, you know, of course, chanting. The, the verse says, pure love of Krishna, Krishna Prema, love of God, right, is eternally established in the hearts of the living entities. That means all of us. It's something that's, it's, it, well, then it goes on to say itself. It is not something to be gained from another source. Wait, it's eternally established, meaning it has a beginning? In, in other words, by saying or, eternally, or it, it, it mean, has meaning, no Okay, it, it, that's what it actually is. Yeah. You could, let's say eternally manifest, if you want to say it that way, right? Yeah. So, so it's something that's always there. It says it's not something to be gained from another source. It's mm. not something outside of ourselves. Which, which, like in this crazy climate where everybody hates each other, I mean, we're in like a type of world where <laughs> I'm looking for somebody good to hate. Um, uh, we, and we were reading, uh, yesterday was the disappearance of Haridas Thakur. So I, I started reading up on Haridas Thakur and he said this great quote, 
which oh, yeah. when you really accept, uh, uh, when you really accept like, oh, everybody is actually a devotee. Even the person that I hate is actually a pure devotee. Then all of a sudden you stop hating. And this is the real magic of stopping hating. Mm -hmm. And this is, the real, this is the real magic of trying to find equality. So this is what Haridas Thakur said. He said, uh, all living beings in creation are inspired, uh, are inspired by the Lord in the heart to act in different ways. People of different religions praise the Lord's holy names and qualities according to the view of their particular scriptures. The Supreme Lord accepts everyone's mood. If anyone shows malice towards another's religion, he actually shows malice to the Lord himself, who is worshiped by that religion. Since God is one, that person becomes envious of the same Supreme Lord that he himself is worshiping. Mm. That's nice. That was from the uh, that was uh, from Prima Velas, but it was uh, Hari Das Thakur speaking. So yeah, in the process of excavating our own natural inherent default that we're a spirit soul, a loving devotee, in the process of doing that, we are in the training of seeing that pure spiritual spark in everyone, and naturally, the ideas of others will melt away and we'll just see people as one. I mean, that's a great point. In other words, if that is my goal, right? Like if, if I've established as a goal, which I would highly recommend <laughs> that um, I want to see every living being as a spiritual entity, right? Yeah. I, then, then, then we need to behave in a way that's consistent with that. We need to speak in a way that's consistent with that. We need to train our mind to think in a way that's consistent with that. And so as you're saying, there's no room for hate, right? There's that, that hate, that, 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 that anger that we get, um, that lack of compassion, that lack of trying to understand um, is, is really um, counter to our, to our yoga goal, to our goal in yoga, right? Mm -hmm. And so the yogi, that's why they develop this tolerance. That's why they're able to, you know, to develop this um, kind of, the compassion is so deep that even if they're, someone offends them, they don't feel offended, right? You, oh, by the way, today, I, I, uh, I should release on, on our Patreon channel for Patreon subscribers, uh, a talk that I gave on Sunday to, uh, you know, the, there's the Bhakti community out in Denver. Yeah, they th to speak. Thriving, thriving, thriving Bhakti community. Yeah, so um, I spoke to them. And, uh, I was wondering and I, what you were going to say. You're like, today I should release. So I was like, what is he keep? What is Kostuba <laughs> keeping captive? A python. I'm going to release a python today. To the streets of New York. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so uh, in that talk, I, I was kind of speaking a, a kind of a, a lot about exactly what you were saying that, you know, our, our practice, it has to do with, we hear, right? Shravanadi, it begins with hearing. But then, as you like to say, you have to, you say, hear it, live it, give it, right? Yeah, learn it, live it, give it, but hear it, live it, give it, same. Yeah, or learn it, live it, give it, okay. Yeah. And, but the, uh, hear it would be, yeah, more perfectly, you know. Yeah, learning, learning you're sitting, yeah. you're questioning. Yeah. yeah, and then to live it, uh, an essential part of what it means to live it is you have to reflect on it as you go through the challenges in life, right? And, when, and so you're saying, you know, there's a, there's a lot of intolerance, there's a lot of hate going around. Because you know we're, we're so quick to judge, we're so quick to to um, to be offended, which is really the opposite of the way that the yogi operates, right? I know, the yogi I is know. like even if you offend them, they don't feel offended. Why? Because they've reflected on the knowledge that within this body that's offending me, this other person, there's a spark that that, and it just as we're reading here, there's a spark. There's, there's a, a spiritual spark. There's the soul. And that soul also has pure love of Krishna eternally established within, right? It's uncovered. Or it's covered now. It needs to be uncovered just like it needs to be uncovered in me, right? And so if by my karma, I've behaved in such a way where I've been due a little suffering and this person has somehow become the agent of that, I don't hold it against them. And in this way, the mind is peaceful, as we've been saying recently, as, as Yudhishthir said, that forgiveness is a peaceful mind, right? 
I, sure. I don't. I'm not offended by it at all. Right. I let it go. And in this way, I move through the world, even with people that disagree with me, even people that um, act offensively towards me, even people who are manifesting hate in a horrible way. I can understand that underneath it all, that there's there's something. And you know, therefore, we hear you know, like the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, right? Right. These great, beautiful souls. You know, these were some of the most important. Um, teachers in the history of the movement of bhakti yoga they lived 500 years ago in vrindavan they wrote so many important texts on bhakti they they established you know so many important uh temples there and revealed the holy places there They're just beautiful characters it's said that they were especially kind to the gentlemen and the ruffians alike yeah they were and they were loved by them all right they were they were loved they were loved by the ruffians yeah, dear, what is it? Dear, ah, dear, ah, jana, priya. They were, they were priya. They were dear to the, and to the dear, ah, and the ah, dear, ah, to the, to those that are like peaceful and, you know, and to those that are like the ruffians, or you can say like the, uh, I don't know. I like the word ruffian. You like the ruffian. Okay, let's just stay with the ruffian. Like the ruffian. That was a good, sometimes Prabhupada, like, so Prabhupada, um, he's like an archaeologist, a, uh, a verbal archaeologist. He just goes and finds some word that, hasn't been used in a while and he polishes it off and shines it up. Ruffian is such a word. Hey, yeah, ruffian. ruffian is a good one, right? So yeah. so the ruffian, you know, if we if the, if when the ruffian comes our way and when the when you know the, the saint, the saintly person, the yogi, even when they're mistreated by the ruffian, you know, generally the people are mistreated by the ruffian, they get all upset, you know, or they're afraid. But 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 the yogi's never afraid, right? The yogi's and not offended, and so even we see the history of great saints that even like criminals and and so on, they they have to appreciate them. Yeah, you know, they have to appreciate them, and so these are the, this is what it means to get really spiritual, you know, to try to really break through and get to this level, not just rationalize our responses, you know, um, even if they can be logically justified, but reaching deeper trying to see deeper trying to see and, and it comes down to that realizing god in my own heart realizing god in the heart of every living being realizing the true spiritual nature of every living being and as it's being described right here what is that nature pure love of god is in is eternally established within this person's heart it's in the heart of the ruffian right pure so it says pure love for krishna is eternally established in the hearts of the living entities it is not something to be gained from another source it's already mm -hmm. there when the heart is purified by hearing and chanting, this love naturally awakens, right? It, it naturally comes out. You know, we're so lucky because in this life we have our, our, our walk and talk in Srimad Bhagavatam in Radnath Swami. And yeah. he, you know, I, I just see like how he's treated me over the years. And, you know, I, I, I think it's safe to say I'm a ruffian. Are you a ruffian? Right? I think I might have been like, <laughs> if you're going to classify my, my genus, or okay. species, I would fall into the rough, ruffian category, and you know it's 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 it can be easily um, just ridden off by a gentleman like who is this loud mouth and just sort of like keep me away or keep me distant and just like write me off basically. There's a lot of people that we just like I don't like them. I'm they're not in my I'm circle not. whatsoever. But, you know, devotees have this beautiful quality of not writing people off, but just tolerating them, tolerating them and giving them as much medicine or truth as possible through compassion. They're compassion. They see that if you're acting crazy, you're probably in pain. If you're out of control, you're probably in pain and they want to give them doses of truth. And then all of a sudden, due to that tolerance, due to that compassion, due to that love, people start to magically change because if you fully believe that underneath whatever they're doing, there's something very beautiful and precious. And sometimes you gotta go deep, but it's there. Then people change. And, it's, and if you have people in your life that have demonstrated that to you, that have given you that tolerance, compassion, and love, and just have gone deep with you, and you feel like, wow, I can change. It gives you hope to change. And truthfully, in bhakti, we've had people like that have just done that with us. And it's our duty to do that back. It's our duty to give that back. That's part of it. Beautiful, Raghunath. Well, 
It's the beautiful Bhagavatam. Yeah. You know, let, 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 let's just read this verse again. It says, only okay. the purified soul can attain the perfection of associating with the personality of Godhead in complete bliss and satisfaction in his constitutional state, right? That's the state that we're talking about, Krishna Prema. Whoever is able to renovate such devotional perfection, once you taste that, once you achieve that, you're never again attracted by this material world and you never return. Now, down in this purport, Joe Prabhupada begins to say, he says, we should further note in this verse, the two words, shantam and anandam. Okay. Shanta means Mara. Hati. Peace. Peace. Right. And Anandam. Eternal. Anandam. Anandam. No, no, blissful. There you go. Okay. And uh, so we should further note in this verse the two words Shantam and Anandam, which denote that devotional service to the Lord can really bestow upon the devotee two important benedictions, namely peace and satisfaction. Everybody's looking for them, right? Peace and satisfaction, sure. I am. The, okay. The impersonalist, the impersonalist, those that their conception of the Supreme uh, does not accommodate the, the personal form. The impersonalist is desirous of becoming one with the Supreme. Or in other words, he wants to become the Supreme. I am God. This is a myth only. The mystic yogis become encumbered by various mystic powers. So first he says, there's those that want the liberation of, of becoming God, becoming the all-pervasive divine light. That, that's a myth that doesn't work. Then he talks about another practice, the mystic yogis, they become encumbered by various mystic powers and so have neither peace or satisfaction. So neither the impersonalist nor that type of yogi can have real peace and satisfaction, right? What's, do you know the verse for this one? I know you do, Raghu. The, the yogi, uh, give, me, give me the first word, first word. I'm having a Sanskrit. Book. Oh, I, you know, I'm slipping with the first word too, but it's, you know, Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami. You know, oh, book, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's um, Krishna Bhakti Niskama Sakale Shanta, Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami Sakale Shanta. Yeah. That you want Bhukti, you want to enjoy your senses? That's yes. a desire. You won't get peace. You won't get peace. You want mystical perfection? That's a desire. You won't be peaceful. You want mukti, you want to be free from the pain of the material world, that's a desire. The only one, once you have desire, you're suffering. The only way to get rid of desire is to, per, all your desire. What, what do you want from me, Krishna? Once you say, whatever you got for me today, Krishna, I'll accept that. That's what's going on today, and I'm going to just keep moving forward. You can actually, it, it's actually real desirelessness, like Buddha talked about. Buddha said you got to get rid of your desires if you want to experience joy right. so um yeah krishna bhakti is desirelessness in its truest sense everything else even mystic powers or liberation uh, leave you wanting there you go so Prabhupada goes on the commentary says so neither the impersonalist nor the yogi that kind of yogi can have real peace and satisfaction but the devotee can become fully peaceful and satisfied because of his association with the complete whole Therefore, merging in the absolute or attaining some mystic powers has no attraction for the devotee. So this verse says, when you taste that connection to God, you're not interested in these other things, right? He says, attainment of love of God, it means complete freedom from all other attractions. The conditioned soul has many aspirations, such as becoming a religious man, a rich man, a first class enjoyer, or becoming God himself, or becoming powerful like the mystics and acting mm -hmm. wonderfully by getting anything or doing anything. These are the mystic cities that he's talking about, these yogic powers that one can get. Um, but all these aspirations should be rejected by the prospective devotee who actually wants to revive his dormant love of God, right? Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema, that dormant love of God that's deep down there, that is comes, that, you know, that grows by what we're doing right now, by watering it with hearing and chanting. The impure devotee aspires after all the above mentioned material things by perfection of devotion. But the pure devotee has none of the tinges of the above contaminations, right? So as we practice bhakti, we begin to let go of even the tinges of these other desires, which are the influence of the material desires, impersonal speculations, and attainment of mystic powers. 
one can attain the stage of love of God by pure devotional service or by a learned labor of love for the sake of the devotee's lovable object, the personality of Godhead. To be more clear, if one wants to attain the stage of love of God, they must give up all desires for material enjoyment. They should refrain from worshiping the demigods because that's generally done for the purpose of material enjoyment. And they should devote themselves only to the worship of this, the Bhag of Bhagavan, right? That's su supreme behind it, it all. It, I think if we remember this whole idea of, uh, it's not because God is saying, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. God's right. just like your mother saying, don't over, don't eat that. Don't eat that. Don't eat that. There's actually some love behind there. It's because it won't actually give you what you actually want. Mm -hmm. If I'm, to, if I can quote a great saint, um, Sir my, uh, Mick Jagger. Sir Mick Jagger. Sir Mick Jagger, when I'm, driving, when I'm driving in my car and a man comes on the radio, he's telling me more and more about some useless information supposed to fire my imagination. I can't get no <laughs> satisfaction. And I try. And I try, 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 try. It's like that's the perfect song of material existence. It it's like captured it, didn't he? He really did. Oh, because if you think of probably about Mick Jagger, I was never a Rolling Stones fan, but the guy probably could have whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And it must, and it leaves a gaping. Because what the problem is with, that's even a bigger problem with those who can actually fulfill their desires. See, some of us can't fulfill our desires. Like, I want to be rich. I can't be rich. You know, I want to. I want a pretty girlfriend or a pretty guy or I can't, uh, none of them like me. I'm not, you know, I'm not tall enough or good looking enough. I'm wealthy enough to impress them. So a lot of times we can't even fulfill those desires. Frustration. But those, yeah, but those people who have some special magic karma where they can actually fulfill all their desires, they're especially, depression especially comes because they realize, no, this won't do it. They generally move either towards like, that, that ping pong we spoke about previously, that boga, that indulgence, and then like, this is disgusting, I'm over it. And boga tiaga, swing back and forth. Or they generally self-regulate. If they, they find, they don't call it dharma necessarily, but they say, I, I just can't do this. This is killing me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mick Jagger, thank you. That, you know, you know um, I don't think uh, Sham Sundar uh, shared it when we interviewed him the other day. Did he? Did he know Mick Jagger too? He yeah. must have. When when they were when he was building like the original temple, in in um oh, oh, Berry Place, Berry Place, Berry Place Temple. So he was he because he had the, he was like kind of a carpenter and everything, Shaman Sunder. And they needed <laughs> like they needed some kind of um special like the the legalities. They needed some kind of special um, beams and uh, I think some marble thing for the altar there and. And they had no money, right. so he asked Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger's like, "Yeah, sure." And Mick Jagger donated that. That. Uh, I wonder that, if that, I wonder if that gave him satisfaction. I hope it did. Imagine if he wrote a second song. <laughs> I donated <laughs> marble, <laughs> helping him call the juggernaut deities. <laughs> I got a little satisfaction there. <laughs> All right. All right. Pretty so, uh, yeah, he carved those deities. Shama Sundar, if you, if anybody here has not listened to that interview yet with um, Shama Sundar, yeah. go back and do some binge listening of the interview with Shama Sundar. This person is phenomenal, and he was like a jack of all trades. Met so, turned so many very famous people. We mainly concentrated on the Beatles. He was with George Harrison on his deathbed, and. Um, he, he was a carver. He, was a, he carved those juggernaut deities. He, he didn't even go. I mean, you really have to read the book, you know, uh, Chasing Rhinos with the Swami to get all the details. The people he was connected with are just like unbelievable. You know, hey, Henry's holding it up there. Henry's got it right there. <laughs> there there it is. All right, we got lots of people holding it up. Kelly's got one. Um, well, yes. So, so in that book, you really see just how connected this person was. You know, and you really get, you really get a picture of the circumstances or the environment in which Bhakti exploded in the Western world. Mm. You know, because you know it, he he describes how like 
because Allen Ginsberg was into Prabhupada on the East Coast, in San Francisco, they were already hearing about Krishna consciousness. There was just already some sort of buzz about that. So then, you know, the local kind of underground newspaper, when he, when Shamasundra went to him and said, hey, you know, we got, got the Swami coming over. They were like doing, he was writing articles about it, even before Shamasundra met Prabhupada, right? They were publishing stuff in these magazines and getting everyone ready. So when they did that Avalon Ballroom concert, which had, of course, you know, Janis Joplin and the Grateful Dead and Moby think, Grape. You always like that one, Moby Grape. You got certain things, Stitcher, Moby Grape. <laughs> it's a good name, Moby Grape, isn't it? Moby Grape, yeah. How'd they get those words together? I don't know. <laughs> but um, so so all those bands, but, it, you know, like the, that whole place was just like ready to receive Prabhupada. And Allen Ginsberg showed up for that and, and the whole thing just took off. But he was moving around with all those people again, like the Hells Angels, the Grateful Dead, the you know, um, Ken Kesey and all of these kind of characters and of course Allen Ginsberg and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a fascinating read for sure. Then the Beatles and then the adventures that he goes on beyond that are just like off the charts. You know? Anyway, people check that out. Check and, out. and yeah. The name of the book is Chasing Rhinos with the Swami. But go stupid. It's safe to say 32 years of Bhakti in it's like, where is our satisfaction in this world? No matter what I do during the course of the day, Reading the Bhagavatam gives me some deep satisfaction. Hmm. Associating with devotees, going to Kirtan. It's like that quality time with people on a spiritual path actually satisfies me. Right. You know? These are the things I hanker for on a regular basis. I, well, wait a second. If I'm hankering for them, then is that satisfaction? It is. Because that's a different type of hankering. <laughs> <laughs> explain that wait a second maybe i'm wrong all these years I'm hankering for the association of spiritual that taste is so great that it's in one sense it's never satiated that's the answer but it's but it's not the kind of frustration that the materialist gets from it their, is from their desires not being ultimately fulfilled yeah we will develop hankerings and addictions so to speak yeah but in those addictions and hankerings, what's happening is it's releasing us from, from crippling addictions and crippling attachments and making us sort of in this world, but not of it. It's actually, it's actually amazing. I feel so lucky to stumble upon this. We really stumbled upon it, if you think about it. It's not like we were great philosophers studying the Vedas for decades. We're like, this is the path. We stumbled upon it. It's amazing. And I guess stumbling upon it means people were kind and merciful to us. That's what it all it really means. So, you know, that's the reason why we stumbled upon it. Hmm. We met some guy with a book. We met like the Yuga Dharma Ashram guys, you know, and they meet somebody on the street and give them a Bhagavad Gita. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to thank these guys again. Appreciate you. Okay. Text 32? Text 32. Your Majesty, Prickett, know that all, the t all that I have described in reply to your proper inquiry is just according to the version of the Vedas, and it is eternal truth. This was described personally by Lord Krishna unto Lord Brahma, with whom the Lord was satisfied upon being properly worshipped. So, yeah, Krishna teaches these, what he's saying, everything, I, here's the disciplic succession, right? Lord Vishnu teaches it to Brahma. <clears throat> We're going to read about that later in this canto. And then, um, and then um, Brahma teaches it to, uh, you know, to Narada. Narada teaches it to Vyasa. Vyasa teaches it to Shukadeva Goswami. Shukadeva Goswami speaks it to Maharaj Pariksit as heard by Sutta Goswami, who speaks it to the sages at Naimisharani. And we get to hear it. All right. So it's, it's handed down step by step by step. Hmm. Text 33, for those who are wandering in the material universe, I guess I qualify for that, um, there is no more auspicious means of deliverance than what is aimed at in the direct devotional service of Lord Krishna. So that's, here's the point, right? We've read about other yoga processes. Sugadeva Goswami just described a couple other yoga pro processes. They're valid practices, but he's saying, but if you really want to focus on the essence right here, then bhakti yoga, yato bhavet. Then focus directly on um, on bhakti yoga. And let's re let's read a little Prabhupada's commentary here. Mm. We got some. We got a little time left. You, would you like to read it? Thirty-three. 
Yeah. As will be clarified in the next verse, devotional service or direct bhakti yoga is the only absolute and auspicious means of deliverance from the grip of material existence. There are many indirect methods for deliverance from the clutches of material existence, but none of them is as easy and auspicious as bhakti yoga. The means of jnana and yoga and other allied disciplines are not independent in delivering a performer. Hmm. It means that if you practice jnana yoga, for instance, that's a practice where you consciously do some hardcore renunciation and sit and analyze every one of your material desires. And through an intellectual process, you analyze it and you break it. And you want to break it, break it, break it. And you, you want to break every material desire that you have. So with such conviction that you lose the desire. Now that's, that's a valid practice. It can be a helpful practice, a very difficult practice, but it's not independent in delivering one because the point of that is that once you achieve that stage where you're free of material desires, then that opens you up to connecting with God in the heart mm. and to bhakti, right? So it's de ultimately it's dependent on bhakti for its completion. And the same is, so here it mentions jnana and yoga, yoga here meaning ashtanga yoga, where you would you know, go off to the forest, practice yama, practice niyama, practice asana, pratihara, et cetera, et cetera, to achieve a state of very uh, advanced control of the mind, where you can go into very deep states of meditation, ultimately get to the state of called samadhi, where the, the, the mind and the senses are completely controlled. And, and that's, that's an incredible, it's a valid path. It's it, again, a very difficult path, but, uh, but, uh, but when one achieves that state of samadhi, the value of it, and this is described in Bhagavatam, this is described in Bhagavad Gita, is that you can connect with God in the heart in that point, at that point. So again, for its completion, it's dependent on bhakti. But here it's saying, now bhakti is a different path because bhakti, the means and the end are the same. What Ashtanga Yoga would take you to, you know, it, it would free you up of a, of, a, of a wandering mind so that you can have an incredibly focused mind so that you can focus that mind on God. Jnana Yoga is going to free you of all your material desires so that you can desire only God. Bhakti Yoga is going to start there. It, you start it and it's immature. You don't have the depth of bhakti, but the practices that you do in bhakti yoga, hearing Bhagavatam, chanting Krishna's names, you're going to do those same things in a state of perfection, right? And it's a path that's not going to require any other path to complete it. It's just a path that you, you mature it, you grow through it. And in that sense, it's, it's the most integral. So when he says the means of Gyan and yoga and other allied disciplines are not independent in delivering the performance, ultimately they require bhakti, they lead towards bhakti. You're muted, Rabana. Sorry. Um, it was just like a little child walking. What do you do to help a child walk? They just walk. They, walk. they fall they down a little, walk. they get up, they just, they get up, they fall down, they get up, they fall down, eventually they're walking. And, they, and this is right. what we're doing. We're just, we're holding on to spiritual principles. We're holding on and trying to walk in this world. And we have bad habits, so we fall down. And then we get back up and pull ourselves up. And then we're attracted to something. And we get off track and we fall down. And it's that getting up and falling down and getting up and falling down and, and still having our eye on the prize of where we want to go with this you know, uh, humble service to Lord Krishna and the devotees, the, the means, the, the, the practice of the walking is actual goal. The goal is actually just to walk forward towards, towards light. And it, after a while, the legs become strong and we're just very focused. And when things are calling us in different directions, we're like, not interested. Been there, yeah. done that. You know, I, it's actually a great example, great analogy that you just use. Because like a baby, how does it learn to walk? It just starts to walk it just tries it stumbles it falls but it just starts to walk it doesn't practice doing leg exercises for a while right like <laughs> you know you put in you put in three months of working out with weights for its legs and then you do something with balance you know you use some kind of balance techniques or some you read books on it no it just starts to practice walking yeah. and so that's what bhakti yoga is the goal of ultimately jnana yoga its value is that it's ultimately lead to bhakti and, and love for god the same with the Shtanga Yoga. Bhakti, you start practicing loving God right in the beginning. You may not have love of God. It's dormant still. But by the practice of it, you practice 
hearing, you practice chanting, and then it, it just becomes uncovered. But the means in the end are the same in bhakti, which is different yeah. than yoga. Here's one to tease that analogy out further. All right. The parent sometimes holds the hands, sticks out his pinkies, the father or the mother, and, and yeah, right, like little pinkies, and the baby holds on just to ease the baby to walk forward, right? Just come on, you can walk, just lift up your hands like the little toddler. That's the guru. Guru's reaching down, extending, we're holding on to those pinkies, but the good guru just doesn't tell the devo devotee what to do, it just helps them along. Just helps the little baby along. <laughs> just <laughs> helps strengthen the legs, and that's what guru is. What do you think Thank about you. that, Kastuba? I, I buy into it. Okay, that works. You buy for into me. that? We yeah. can keep that analogy. All right, let's yeah. do that. And what do you think about this, Kastuba? I think it's time to, to, to sponsor a set of Bhagavatam on this auspicious day. On Budger Purnim, you know who to reach. You reach out to NYC. What's the NYC, NYC. Bhakti? B H A K T I at gmail.com. Write these guys, they're great guys. It's not like we're trying to promote their bookstore. This is what they do. They, they're monks and they distribute books because they believe that the highest thing you can give is spiritual wisdom. So they dedicate this portion of their lives to that. And it's quite beautiful and we're quite inspired. Thank you, men and women who do it. And um, I want to thank everybody for uh, here on Zoom today for waking up early. It's hard to wake up early. I slept, I, I went to bed late. I was hanging out with Parman on the last night. And I, oh. I'm tired, I had like four hours of sleep. But you know what? All these guys, uh, Joe Adamo and Baby Joe, man. I feel like I can't let Baby Joe down. <laughs> Look at Baby Joe's clapping. You were, you were reading uh, Prima Velas or something? What were you reading? I think it was from the Prima Velas. You were reading that with, with uh, Parmananda? No, we weren't. We weren't reading that. We were just hanging out. Okay. It, yeah, that would have been nice if we were reading. Yeah, maybe I'll go back today and read Prima Velas, Parmananda. That's a great book. There you go. <laughs>